While I profoundly agree with the principles, I can't resist a but. Is there not a line where your principle fails? While you're concerned about a court putting an issue beyond one side of the debate, aren't there issues which we want to be beyond the pale? Slavery or murder, for example. And aren't there politicians who deserve outrage and who we should refuse to accommodate? Might Trump be one? Perhaps he's the one the impeachment laws were made for. There are politicians who are beyond the pale, and there are positions that are beyond the pale, and everybody can bring up the Hitler example um, as a way of thinking about this, but we ought to be as reluctant as it is possible to be to use that, um, that approach. I think there are certain positions that probably deserve to be constitutionalized. Um, and what I said this evening was not that we should eschew constitutionalization altogether, but we should be as careful about it as we possibly, as we possibly can, and not simply let our in indignation, our confidence that our position is correct, or our um, discomfort or offense at another person's position be a reason for constitutionalizing. It should be a last resort. Um, and similarly, I think, with recognizing certain individuals as being beyond the pale of toleration and civility. I disagree with the question of that President Trump is in this category. If he is, then there are going to be an awful lot of politicians in the future who are going to be beyond civility, and I'm not sure how we're going to run a democracy on that basis. You've created a moral equivalence between Clinton and Trump in terms of lack of civility. Trump supporters have been racist, some creating mock lynchings of Obama and many challenging his nationality, and sexist and, mis and misogynistic, threatening rape against Secretary Clinton. Clinton spoke out against this, however uncivil, and yes, there's been talk of impeachment of Trump, but surely there's a difference. We can be neutral about the exercise of rights and treat our opponents in such exercise as merely opponents, but attacks on the actual rights themselves need to be fought back against however we can. All right. That's it? <laughs> yeah. So I'm not, I'm not interested in the question of moral equivalence or lack of equivalence between Secretary Clinton and Donald Trump. That goes back to the, the kind of infantile approach of who started it or who's worse. The question is, if we get this level of incivility, with maybe different levels on different sides, but it's there, civility and mutual incivility uh, are reflecting the politics. The question is, what's it gonna look like if this continues? And there, the question of whether Hillary Clinton was the moral equivalent of Donald Trump and the incivility stakes doesn't matter. The fact is that both sides are becoming increasingly un uncivil. Both sides are becoming increasingly uncomfortable with dealing civilly with one another. And so I want to put the issue of moral equivalence to one side. I'm perfectly willing to concede for the sake of argument if anybody wants to say that President, um, that President Trump is more uncivil than his opponent. But the fact is that we now have incivility on both sides and that's a problem. For every Martin Luther King, don't we also need a Malcolm X to achieve justice and change? I don't know. I, I mean, again, I think it's simplistic to say for every Martin Luther King you need a Malcolm X. Sometimes you need a Malcolm X, sometimes you don't. And Malcolm X has particular, particular views that are appropriate in some circumstances and not in others. When we think about Martin Luther King, and this is a reply to a question that I was asked in person a few minutes ago about other figures in the civil rights movement, um, when we think about Martin Luther King, one of the things we think about is civil disobedience. Now the word civil there is not just, is not just a word for nice or disobedience that we approve of. It's a mode of disobeying the laws that takes intensely seriously the civic dimension of that and takes, takes seriously the notion that even when you are disobeying the laws, you, your demeanor and your actions convey to your opponents that you are committed to remaining present in the same political system as, as they are. It's different from revolutionary disobedience. And so if somebody says to me, did Rosa Parks exhibit um, civility or incivility in her actions with regard to the desegregation of bus transportation in the community when she, where she lived, 
My answer would be she was engaging in civil disobedience and took the duty of civility very seriously indeed, as indeed did Dr. King. In your address, you identified the plurality of views in the political discourse as an ultimate good. Historically, you've been in favour of hate speech legislation. How do you prevent such legislation becoming a tool for those who would seek to quell dissenting views, and how do you reconcile it with your views on the role of the judiciary? Okay, um, very interesting. Uh, with things like hate speech legislation, you again have to be very careful. I think when I look at New Zealand's hate speech legislation or Britain's hate speech legislation, the enforcement of legislation against people who are stirring up racial hatred or religious hatred with their speeches, the legislation aims to bend over backwards so as to deal only with the most egregious cases. They are filtered through the discretion of the Attorney General. There are safe havens for various forms of speech. There are insistence that the speech has to be not only uh, hate generating, but also abusive, insulting, and threatening. And so you design the legislation so as to um, avoid as far as possible simply demonizing everybody you, dis you disagree with. Um, I'm gonna leave aside the question about uh, uh, how, how I reconcile that with judicial um, authority, but except to, just to say this, that I believe um, judges will have a role to play in the enforcement of hate speech legislation. In some communities, justices have a role to play in the striking down of hate speech legislation in the United States, uh, for example. But um, whether that is a good role for judges to have in general or in particular is something that I'll talk about on another occasion. How do you foster civil political discourse when the media is obsessed with sound bites and sensationalism? Yeah, it's a very good question. Um, the media is obsessed with sound bites and sensationalism. Why? One reason is that the media have persuaded themselves that this is what their listeners, readers, and uh, uh, watchers expect. And I find in my dealings with um, uh, news media journalists, and people in social media, is that they're engaged in a fairly substantial surrender to what they imagine are the sensibilities of the latest generation of watchers and listeners. They say young people don't want to read long stories, or young people don't want to study uh, anything longer than a soundbite. I'm not sure that that's true, but an ethos has built up among the journalists that, or among the bloggers that this is the case, uh, and we have adjusted our expectations accordingly. It's probably a mistake to say this is simply the fault of the media, but it's the fault of the media persuading themselves that this is what people want. The, the, the solution, if there is one, is for people to make it clear that they actually want to read more stuff, that they want to have something longer than a science sound bite, they want to have a podcast, or they want to have um, a, a story posted online that takes more than a few screens uh, to read your way through. Does the electoral system affect civility? In New Zealand, the MMP system forces parties to deal civilly with differences. In the USA, things seem to be otherwise. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, it does force um, parties to deal civilly with their differences because they have to form coalitions with other parties that they're not necessarily comfortable with. Um, on the other hand, one of the virtues of parties back in the day when, when uh, I belong to the Dunedin Central Labour Party, um, was that you learned in the party how to bundle together large bundles of public policy. Parties were not single issue or even just a, an array of issues. They were, the, they, they were taking a whole approach to the government of the country and they were developing ways of thinking and compromising, trading off among different positions. And I think there is a danger that parties are defining themselves around particular, particular issues like environment and, uh, and so on. So I think it's very important to recognize that on the one hand, the premise of the question is correct. Parties engaged in possible coalition building need to be able to deal civilly with each other. But on the other hand, the logic of party formation may be a problem if parties are increasingly becoming um, less and less involved in the business of bundling policies together and making sure that everybody understands that one set of policies and principles can't stand alone but have to be reconciled with the other demands 
on public expenditure and so on. Do you think there is a relationship between engagement and civility? For example, in New Zealand we are civil, but potentially this is because many people are unengaged politically. Maybe we are not civil, just disinterested. Yeah, it's possible. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, it really is possible. Political scientists have often said the more participation you get, the more you're going to get anger and vehemence and indignation and uh, rage and resentment coming to the fore. Only if you can somehow damp down popular participation can you prevent incivility from rising. And I suppose that's the point of view. And then one of the things we would say about what we've just seen in Europe, in England, in um, the United States, is that the rise of populism has defied that attempt to damp down anger and so on. I think it's a mistake. I think it's very important that if there is anger uh, and resentment and rage uh, in the community, that people find ways of expressing it and find ways of at least trying to develop um, political positions that will um, respond, respond to that. So I don't, I don't believe that more popular participation necessarily co correlates with less civil um, participation, but it's certainly... Um, uh, it's certainly possible that there would be, um, in certain circumstances, that, that sort of correlation. Jeremy, I'm disappointed you used Roe versus Wade as an example with this audience. If you want them to challenge their own assumptions and, quote, happy victories, what about Hobby Lobby or Hosanna Table? What's Hosanna Table? I'm just reading it out. Yeah. <laughs> Right, thank you very much. Um, I don't know, there's a, there are a number of cases that one could bring up. One could bring up also the cases about um, uh, the participation of public registrars in gay marriage as well. What I wanted to convey, and Roe against Wade was a good way of conveying this, was that the attempt to take an issue like abortion, on which there is massive disagreement in the society, and good reason for such disagreement, because it's a tough, tough issue to figure out, where there's massive disagreement, and we actually have a history now of um, 45 years since the seminal decision in Roe against Wade. So we have a, had a reasonable opportunity to test the impact of constitutionalization, which we haven't had in these, in these uh, other cases like Hobby Lobby. Um, so it was worth bringing up um, Roe against Wade as a, as, a, as a simple example. Did the removal of abortion politics from the ordinary political process of majoritarian voting and legislation in fact detoxify the issue? Did it lead to more civility by taking it out of politics? And the answer is no. It, it didn't do that at all. What it did was convince at least one side to the disagreement that they were not being taken seriously um, as participants in public decision about a matter that they thought was tremendously important on which they disagreed with half or more than half of their, of their fellow citizens. So there was a reason for focusing on Roe against Wade. It was, it was if one had to give one example, and, and one can't stand up here all night and give you example after example after example. So the point was to show that sometimes the removal, the attempt to remove an issue from politics doesn't necessarily have a, an affirmative positive impact on the civility with which the underlying issue is dealt with. You paint a rosy picture of the ability of the legislative process to maintain civility, but those who lost the same-sex marriage vote in New Zealand were told they were on the wrong side of history. Isn't that the kind of you were wrong in civility you say is wrong? Yes, no, ab absolutely. Um, if you say you're on the wrong side of history, you say that it was inappropriate for you to have held this view in the first place. Um, it's, it's better to acknowledge that there was massive disagreement on this issue, but by a fairly significant margin, one side won and the other side lost. It could have gone the other way, it didn't but there was nothing disreputable or inherently disreputable about the view being uh, promoted in the legislature. 
In your opinion, Professor, can there be an absolute truth to any debate? And if so, do you believe consensus can be reached in civility? Yeah, just go over that again, Alex. An absolute truth in what? Uh, an absolute truth to any debate. Yeah. And if so, do you believe consensus can be reached in civility? Yeah. Um, yes, there can be absolute truth in any debate, or in some debates. Um, the difficulty is recognizing it. Um, often what you have on both sides is a conviction that on each part that the side we hold has absolute truth. Yeah? So the two people locked in disagreement with one another both believe in absolute truth. They simply disagree about where it's located. And short of absolute truth disclosing itself in neon in the skies, all we have on earth are the views of us humans and our convictions that these views are not conditional, they're not, uh, um, they're not uh, culturally relative. So absolute truth claims, I think, are perfectly reasonable for people to make. It's just that it's very difficult to vindicate them and they're often held on both sides of a dispute. And as long as they're held on both sides of the dispute, I believe we should not be in the business of trying to disqualify one side from participation in debate. How do you see it playing out in the US? Will civility come back, or will it get worse? Donning a, donning a futurist hat, what do you foresee? I don't know, it's, um, I mean, nobody should be interested in, in my answer to this question, because um, I don't know, like, it, nobody knows. But it could well get worse. It could well get worse, and if it does get worse, it's not clear to anybody now how it gets better. Um, if it gets worse, and it continues to be predicated on people, simply having no familiarity with anybody who holds an array of views that are different from their own, because they don't see them, they don't mingle with them, they don't work with them, and they don't live next door to them, then it's possible that the, um, you could have emerging effectively two nations who are unintelligible uh, to each other. Uh, we've been that way before, it was not a, a, pretty, a pretty sight. Um, I don't know how it gets better but I'm, I'm a kind of a glass half full person and I think there might be ways in which people can, at the level of micro civility and at the level of the examples that are set by politicians, begin to walk this back a little bit. And we still see occasional politicians, I mentioned John McCain, uh, attempting to do that. You mentioned that religion sometimes increases polarization of political views. Is there a role for interfaith dialogue to improve civility? Um, there's a role for interfaith dialogue anyway, whether it improves civility or not. But certainly those who hold religious views need to get used to talking to people who hold other religious views. And those who hold a particular set of religious views that have a bearing on public policy need to get familiar, get some practice in talking to those who hold views on other sides of public policy. But in the United States, we're heading in the opposite direction. Um, we have, for example, you know about this, um, we have Baptist Christians turning up at funerals for serving military officers, holding up signs saying, your son died because America is um, promoting homosexuality. We have the most insensitive displays of religious convictions and any attempt by anybody to engage with those who are holding these views and holding up these signs seems to meet with, with, um, with um, complete contempt and derision from those who are engaged in it. So there are aspects of religious opposition that are profoundly troubling. Um, and there are aspects of religious opposition that seem to defy any possibility of interfaith dialogue or even anything remotely resembling it. So uh, it's, it's quite a worry. On the other hand, you know, um, every Presbyterian minister, every Anglican um, vicar, every um, um, mainline Methodist are engaged in interfaith dialogue incessantly all the time. So uh, at the level of traditional, of the traditional churches, this is happening continually. You mentioned etiquette and not talking about politics and so on at the table. But surely that is exactly where we should be practicing having civil conversations. Yeah, just, just read it again, would you, Alex? You mentioned etiquette and not talking about politics and so on at the dinner table. 
surely that's the place where we should be practicing how to have civil conversations. Yeah, maybe that's right. Maybe that's right. Um, certainly on family occasions where people assemble from diverse points of the compass, they come together for Thanksgiving, or they come together for Christmas. And, um, and when the uh, matriarch or patriarch of the family says, no politics tonight, I mean, you can understand what he or she is saying. They don't want bits of turkey to be thrown around the room. And... <laughs> but on the other hand, they need to understand that this may be the sole opportunity in the lives of the assembled family members to actually talk with people who hold views that are uh, radically different from their own. So I accept the point of the question. Would an upper house in New Zealand improve civility and curb the parliamentary recklessness that the current government has taken to new heights? Yeah. Again, would you, would you? Would, I'm sorry. Would an upper house in an New upper Zealand? House, excuse me, yes. Yes. Um, probably, I don't know. Um, as you know from what I said that when, it, when last I stood at this lectern, I think the lack of an upper house is an enormous um, problem in New Zealand politics and it leads to legislation not being taken seriously as a deliberative forum. On the other hand, the existence of an upper house in the United States is not necessarily improving matters at the moment. There are one or two senators, but they are just one or two who are engaging in civil politics. The others seem to be as angry and as indignant with their opponents as any members of the polity are. So it's not a, it's not a panacea. I happen to believe in New Zealand it would make things slightly better. I think this is the, uh, the final question that we have time for, which I've now lost. As a teacher, what do you recommend is fostered for our next generation of voters who have a great deal of cynicism and detachment from politics altogether? Right. Uh, next generation of voters who have a great deal of cynicism and detachment um, whoever's teaching them civics needs to stop simply teaching them in the United States to recite the names of the 50 state capitals or the Pledge of Allegiance, but teach them a little bit about the problems that the society needs to address, um, whether they like it or not. Issues about climate change, issues about inequality, issues about um, entitlements programs, issues about social security. Uh, issues about globalization and issues about immigration. We need to teach them to debate these problems. We need to teach them the fact that debating these problems is not just a game, but it's an activity we engage in because these problems need to be addressed and solutions need to be found. Maybe not once and for all solutions, but solutions for the time being. Um, so whether people are cynical about politics or not, they need to grow up and understand that there are political problems that require to be addressed. And if in their cynicism they are, they announce that they're bored with the, with the with the politics because it's not as exciting as a video game. Um, they need to be told that the politics is not just a game; it's a way of addressing the very real problems, which, if left un, uh, unaddressed, are going to seriously damage the lives of um, their friends, their family, and so on.